Well, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Nick Gowing. I'm sitting in London, uh, and I'm joined, hopefully, by three guests to talk about how we nurture inclusive leadership. And I'm hoping that we're going to be joined shortly by Antonio Vittorino, who is Director General of the International Organization for Migration in Geneva. Uh, I've seen that he's trying to get in, um, uh, but has not yet made it. So bear with us. I hope Antonio will join us. But first of all, let me introduce uh, two of our guests, uh, Rania Al-Mashat, who's Minister of International Cooperation in Egypt. Welcome, Rania. And also uh, Princess Martha Louise of Norway. Welcome to you uh, both. Now, what I'd like to understand literally quickly, if you can, what is your understanding of inclusive leadership? In other words, what are we trying to nurture? What are we trying to give the pointers towards? Um, Minister, you've got a lot of experience, particularly in international economic organizations. What are you seeing as the deficiencies in leadership and therefore what we need to overcome in order to and, and nurture? Uh, thank you very much, Nick, and I'm happy to to join you this morning, uh, Princess Martha, and hopefully Antonio. I think inclusive uh, leadership uh, is a very uh, in time type of leadership. Today, we find that everyone wants to feel that they belong in the story, in the narrative. Uh, for uh, leaders to uh, be convincing, they need to be very authentic, uh, and they need to be present in every moment. Uh, and that is something that uh, when I look at uh, participating in different international institutions, previously as Minister of Tourism, now as Minister of International Cooperation, the way to create uh, engagement with the stakeholders and stakeholders here could be those who are your subordinates, your peers, even the uh, public that want to be part of your story is to uh, communicate uh, in, a, in a very transparent way. And this is something that social media uh, allows us to do. Uh, be very clear about your objectives uh, and also uh, do some stock taking uh, so that people can see whether or not the objectives that you set are being met. Let me, uh, there's a danger of getting stuck in jargon here, let me, and aspirations. Let me just press you. What do you mean by authentic leadership? Because the expectations of the public now are increasingly different anxious, but also expecting an enormous amount beyond what many leaders, corporate or political, have d delivered so far? I think, uh, I think COVID uh, is, a, is a case in point. Authenticity here means that you really uh, show that uh, uh, you're not just creating policies on paper, uh, but these policies are ones which are implementable uh, and that uh, you bring your true self into the conversation and you bring your true, true self into uh, understanding uh, what the needs of the public are and what the needs of your constituency is. But I'm going to keep pressing you before I go to Martha, if I may. True self, of course, many of those in leadership, whether in the corporate sector or the political sector, actually are, are thinking about their political ambitions. Uh, what is the true self? Because it could be, and certainly we found this in all our thinking, the unthinkable work, that actually um, the, the, the qualifications that get you to the top are not what is necessary now for inclusive leadership. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I've taken a different, uh, uh, you know, practice leadership, but also taken a different, uh, uh, I would say, uh, educational modules on leadership. And those uh, that leave a lasting impression with the people are those who really, uh, uh, when I say authenticity, it is, it is understanding what's needed. And also, it, when you are taking a picture with someone or when you are listening to a story of someone or acting on, on uh, uh, someone's uh, uh, sort of needs, uh, it's, not, it's not just uh, an opportunity to be featured, but it's one where you actually, uh, this, this genuity uh, of, of wanting to solve a problem uh, comes out very clear. Right. Well, thank you. Um, let's let, we'll move on in, in, in that um, vein in a moment. Let's go to, to Oslo, to uh, Princess Martha Louise. Um, now, Princess Martha, of course, uh, you come from a background in, in royalty, therefore you don't have to be elected or anything like that. But what's your feeling about how leadership needs to change? What is inclusive leadership? Ah, I think um, Martha has disappeared. Uh, so uh, I can't see her on on the 
the posting at the moment. So, Rania, let me come back to you because this may end up as a as a bilateral discussion for rather a long time. And I would like to encourage anyone to to file questions as well to us. Um, we're not doing very well on the on the technology here, and then Antonio must be. Um, I know he's been trying to get on because I can see him waving at me, but but I have not yet seen him in vision. Rania, when you look at what you've been doing, particularly before you became a minister in international organisations, do you think the the penny has dropped about how there's a new expectation of what leaders have to be because the public now expects so much, which is so different. Yes, I, I, I think that business as usual uh, is not, uh, you know, uh, something that uh, when everybody talks about the new normal, it's not just about how economies are constructed, but it's how priorities are also set uh, within international institutions, within uh, governments, within corporates. Uh, so today, for example, uh, if I'm looking at a business, uh, businesses are not just, uh, uh, you know, convincing uh, through profits, but they also have to take into account environment, sustainability, governance structure. So this whole concept of ESGs is something where uh, 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 corporates, uh, in order to uh, continue to have their customers, need to also provide uh, a good story. And that is inclusiveness. That is that they that they uh, worry about not just the profit today, but about the medium term. Same thing with multilateral institutions. For instance, I worked at the IMF for several years. Uh, and uh, when Christine Lagarde came on board, for the first time, the IMF started talking about gender issues, an institution that has to do with financial stability and monetary policy, very dry topics. Uh, uh, started looking at gender issues from a macroeconomic perspective. And here, uh, the, the word that was used is that uh, women participa participation is macrocritical. And afterwards, you see that IMF programs with countries pushing for uh, uh, economic growth and so forth had to have a certain uh, criteria related to women, which is inclusivity. So absolutely. And uh, today, when you look at, uh, uh, if you want to call it the, the, the big headlines or the jargon, is uh, you want a recovery where you try to leave no one behind. So I think all of these uh, messages uh, are becoming more integrated in the policy frameworks and the policy formulation within governments, within corporates, and in this stakeholder capitalism uh, that also includes civil society and everyone else. What kind of feeling, though, and I'm sorry, again, we don't yet have Martha back or Antonio from the IOM in Geneva. What kind of resistance do you feel you, you even you as a as a minister, a, a, a woman minister are facing when it comes to the, the kind of traditional form of leadership and those who've been there a long time? In other words, how much of a battle has this become for someone like you? I mean, I, 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 I'm always asked that question and I, I, I find it very difficult to respond because um, we, when you take a look at my credentials, when you take a look at, uh, at uh, you know, uh, being one of the youngest ministers in Egypt and coming from uh, the IMF to first become Minister of Tourism, which is a completely different field. It's a male-dominated uh, uh, sector and it's 15% of Egypt's GDP. So for the political leadership to take that bet, it means that uh, uh, the, the, this concept of gender was not one that was key, but it was really uh, the competency. And this is a story that I like uh, saying because of the uh, sort of perception around uh, women in office. And when I took over uh, Ministry of Tourism, I had to engage with all the stakeholders. Private sector was 98% of, of, of tourism, mostly male. And the idea is everybody's included in the decision making, formulated a very clear uh, program. Everybody knew what they needed to do. And by the when I was leaving, we got the highest uh, revenues in Egypt's history. So the, I believe that examples like this, when they are brought up and explained, they actually encourage the leadership to take uh, more bets on uh, uh, on females and actually encourage uh, the citizens to see that there is uh, uh, not necessarily uh, this uh, perception or bias uh, that is related to gender. But do you find, have you found there's resistance? We've not just got um, Jacinda Hearn in, in New Zealand, but we've got uh, um, a, a woman prime minister in Finland. We've got Slovakia. We've got many other places as well. Are you, and it's also generational as well, everyone much younger. Do you feel that that is the way that you're going to get inclusive leadership simply because you are more in touch with the next generation apart from anything else? Uh, I think that, uh, you know, um, I, in a situation of mine, I have to deal with different colleagues and my colleagues sometimes are older, sometimes uh, are same age, uh, you know, so there's, 
it's it, I believe that uh, uh, the the reason why I've been able to push on different topics is for uh, what I call the four C's. Competence comes number one, connections, confidence, and charm. And these I have been able to apply in the different jobs I've taken, whether at the IMF, whether at the Central Bank of Egypt, uh, Minister of Tourism, and now Ministry of International Cooperation. I mean, I'm interested by your four C's, particularly the last one. And Martha has now joined us. I'm going to come to you in one moment. Let's hope the, the signal is stable, Martha. But charm. Are you saying that charm is something which both men and women leaders can exert? Or is it only particularly from women? No, charm means that you have social, uh, sorry, you have emotional intelligence. It's how you deal in certain situations. There are situations where my subordinate is double my age. How do I get involved and engaged uh, and ready to contribute, but also uh, take, uh, uh, I wouldn't say orders, but take uh, uh, guidance on things to do. Uh, sometimes I, I sit in, in uh, all men meetings uh, and I, you know you you know your your subject matter. So how how where I mean how do you use that experience and emotional intelligence? I just put it in the in the under the word charm, but it's not necessarily uh, a feminine a trait. It's it's it goes uh, it goes uh, for both. And you can see male charm as well, can you? All right, now Rania, thank you, uh, and I can see Martha, you're you're able to smile. And I know you've missed a little bit of what we've been saying, but um, I was when I introduced you, I said, of course, yeah. you are um, uh, your Highness uh, Princess Martha Louise of Norway, and therefore you come from the royal family. But help us understand because you're actually running a, a running a different kind of life now, and you've made a very specific um, role for yourself in this issue, on this issue, uh, particularly of leadership. What is your feeling about, um, what leadership I is needed? Because, because I was coming to you and asking what kind of le leadership are we talking about? What is inclusive leadership in your view? Well, I think that the COVID-19 has given us a, an amazing chance to, um, <laughs> recalculate and really come Martha, back. Martha, you're, you're, you're not going to you're not going to like me saying this, but I'm afraid I um, can't I, uh, really hear you. It's very distorted. Your signal. Can I ask you to just say one more time? Can you? And um, hello. Can you no, I'm afraid we're struggling to. We can't even me? understand. I can see that, and I can see your face. We can just about see your face of disappointment. I'm not sure what to suggest, um, but uh, please. We're going to go off you, Martha, for a moment uh, in the hope that you can reestablish um, uh, some kind of connection. Let me um, ask you to say two or three other things. First of all, uh, I think about what you really um, feel very strongly about, particularly about resilience. Um, Minister, uh, what, what is your point about resilience? Is there a a danger of being so resilient as a leader, you're, you're frankly bloody minded. And no, I, I mean, actually, resilience means that you're, a, you're able to adapt to the different uh, circumstances. And, and it's, it's the uh, governments that uh, had modules which were resistant and corporates which had uh, modules of resistance, uh, resilience, uh, that were able to uh, uh, basically move ahead with, with COVID. And, and the, the resilience within a, a corporate or a government uh, has to be within that DNA so that we uh, move ahead. This is not going to be the last crisis we face as a pandemic. There might be crises related to cyber attacks or climate. Uh, and you need to be able to uh, uh, build, uh, uh, you know, risk assessment and, and risk functions and need to be part and parcel of what we do every day. So resilience to me is the only way to stay relevant. All right. Now, Martha, let me try one more one more time to see if we can connect with you. You're smiling, which is good, but let's try again. Yes. It's marginal, but let, let's me? see. Talk slowly can and let's hope we can pick up your language. Okay, so um, what I was saying was that um, I think COVID-19 has given us a uh, an amazing I'm new afraid, chart, Martha, I'm afraid we're struggling here. Could I ask you to, to, to sign in again? I'm sorry, um, and I can see that uh, Rania in Cairo as well is feeling the same way. We just can't make out the context of, of, of what you're saying. So can I ask you to try and dial in again, please, and see if you can get another signal? Um, is um, Greg Millen out there? Because I think he wants to, to make a point. 
Greg, are you there? Uh, Greg, I think you're requesting the mic and I've accepted you. Can you can you come in? I need to know what your question is. No, I, no one there. Let's pick up, um, Rania, on on the impact of, of COVID-19, where, what you're seeing in uh, the Republic of Egypt, um, and particularly what you've seen across your region, which yes. has been decimating in so many ways, and each country has handled it in a very different way. But you've, you've talked about a silver lining in the pandemic, yes. particularly accelerating reforms, and you're in a country which, even with the rocky times there have been in the last few years, um, reform has been very much on the agenda. Think a bit more broadly than Egypt. What are you seeing, quite apart from the horrors of what's happening in Le has happened in Lebanon? Um, whether, what do you mean by accelerating reforms? Can you feel that COVID-19 has affected the public servants around you, making them think more dramatically and more dynamically? Okay, let me just uh, first start by saying that COVID-19 was an experiment uh, of exactly like a fire drill, okay? And uh, leadership had to come quickly together, very quickly do things that we were unable to imagine before, uh, to have uh, the Egyptian bureaucracy, which is around 4 million employees, uh, work from home and still have the functions uh, of the government uh, uh, go quickly through technology that we we have, education online, etc. These were all very important, important uh, experiments, if you will, and tests which were uh, uh, un uh, unexpected. But what when I say that uh, reforms is a continuous process, uh, between 2016 and 2019, uh, we had an IMF program, and this program meant that we were moving to more fiscal consolidation. We were moving to a more flexible uh, exchange rate. Uh, we were opening up the economy more, and therefore we entered 2020 with uh, uh, good uh, fiscal buffers and foreign exchange buffers. And this was very, very useful at the beginning uh, of COVID, of course, because we were able to extend our social safety nets. We were able to uh, include more of the informal sector uh, into the formal sector. And this was a reform that we wanted to do before. But because of COVID, we were pushed to do it faster. Uh, also, when it came to uh, gender, uh, Egypt was the first country to have a COVID gen uh, gender uh, policy. And we have a policy tracker, which is a tracker, which is published every month to basically see how the government is doing on that. And it was picked up by UN Women and done in coordination with them. So that is what I mean by, uh, by silver lining, moving on uh, faster on the financial inclusion agenda. So we, you know, that is that is also something that uh, regulations were changed very quickly, so that people could, rather than queue in banks, be able to get their cash transfers uh, on their mobiles and so forth. So, so the the spirit uh, of uh, or the silver lining that I see in COVID is that really uh, we had to think in an innovative way. In 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 uh, in, a, in a fast and agile way to be able to uh, to weather uh, to weather the shock. And what is going to remain uh, after COVID settles is how governments continue to be uh, 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 committed uh, to their fiscal discipline, uh, committed uh, to inclusivity of uh, of uh, of their um, uh, uh, whether it's women or vulnerable groups. And that is something that uh, hopefully, uh, when all of this settles, Egypt will have. Good. Well, I've got Jitesh Shetty coming in, who's from Quick Labs. Uh, welcome, Thank you. Jitesh. I'm going to come to you in one moment. But let me just pick up on one thing from the minister. Has it really changed the mindset? Have people really risen to it, really risen to this as a challenge? Because in many ways, it's an existential challenge. Yes. Have they really changed their behavior and their culture? Have they, have they done it reluctantly or have they gripped the enormity of, 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 of what is happening and therefore the implications for them? Of course, you know, the, 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 it's COVID for all of us citizens. Uh, uh, I'm just talking as an individual. It is survival, right? You have to wear your mask. You have to try. Yeah, but I'm and talking about within the, I'm talking about within the public service, the, those who are working for you and with you. Uh, uh, I didn't understand the question. Well, about how much they've really changed and understood the need for change. Absolutely. That's silver lining. Absolutely. I mean, if you are talking about, uh, I, you know, in the ministry here, since March 17, we have been working from home remotely. Uh, only 10 people show up uh, who are needed, and that's it. So these, these are experiments that were unthinkable before. And uh, the other thing is, uh, because we're, we're Ministry of International Cooperation, we have to mobilize 
uh, development partners around certain development projects. And therefore, the uh, uh, how fast you are in putting the priorities uh, going forward is something else that we were pushed very much to do, not just us, but also with our line ministries that had to do with electricity, uh, uh, SMEs, uh, agriculture, irrigation. So this was uh, a very important experiment to see how fast uh, as policymakers, we can come together, make the difference, how important our transparency was with the public in terms of, you know, the t different types of lockdowns that we had. We didn't have a full lockdown. We had partial lockdowns to keep this trade off between lives and livelihood. So it's it's been a very uh, important uh, experiment for Egypt. And one last thing I want to conclude with reforms on the health sector were done before COVID. There was the hundred uh, million uh, uh, what we call health uh, exercise that was uh, where where the Ministry of Health would go around Cairo to identify uh, uh, people with uh, chronic diseases of diabetes and blood pressure, and they were given uh, they were given different uh, medication. And this could be one of the reasons why the numbers have not are less than what have been expected at the all right. Well, it's interesting you mentioned unthinkables. That's exactly the, the root of our project for the last six years, how you get everyone at your level and right down through the chain, both in public service and corporates, to think differently. Now, I was about to go to Jitesh, but he's disappeared. So it's not my day, is it? Um, are you there, Jitesh, still? Yes, you are. Good. Um, Jitesh Seti, do come in. Where are you speaking from? Jitesh, are you there? Uh huh. Well, we're not having much luck because Martha hasn't come back either. Ah, Jitesh, are you coming back? Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can Good. hear you. Good, right. We can see you. We can hear you. We have a signal. So what's your point to the minister? There are two other participants, but we're not having much luck with them at the moment. So go ahead. Would you like to speak? Jitesh, would you like to speak? All right, I'm going to um, Aditya Singh. Uh, uh, hopefully, you're you're going to come on as well. Um, so let me accept that you can speak to uh, Professor Aditya Singh. I'm not sure where you're coming in from. Here you are, Aditya. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, Nick. I'm your lucky uh, person. You can hear me. Uh, Indeed. Where are you speaking from? Let's 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 grab you while we can. What's your point, please? And where are you speaking I'm from? I'm from Bombay in India. And my question to the Honorable Minister is, what are the gaps which are still there for women empowerment in Egypt and in the larger context of the world, both from government and corporate sectors, given the situation of patriarchy which still exists in society? Is that particularly with reference to India as well? I'll is smile. Okay, good. A uh, minister, stay on the line, can you, Aditya? Thank you so much. And uh, you know the the the, the you know gender uh, or women participation is extremely important uh, to increase GDP. And why I'm saying this is it's not just uh, today on the agenda because it's a vulnerable a vulnerable group that needs to be pushed. But actually, there's an economic impact uh, that is very very uh, sound, documented, quantifiable. For instance, if we have a parity. Here in Egypt, our GDP grows by 34% more. So this is very, very important. What we have done uh, since 2017, there's a national strategy for women. Today, we have 25% females in cabinet. We have 15% in parliament. And there are targets for 2030. We are the first country in Africa and the Middle East to, uh, with the World Economic Forum, uh, be part of closing the Gender Gap Accelerator, which is a public-private platform uh, where we put policies together to basically ensure that uh, there's more uh, inclusivity for women in jobs and more in leadership positions. And this is very important because it's not just a public policy, but we include also uh, the private sector. Uh, and hopefully, we you know we can we can keep you abreast with the uh, progress on that. But this is a very important, uh, uh, I would say, initiative because we have the international standards, because we have the World Economic Forum, and we want to make sure that we are able to tell our story, which exists. I don't think many people know about the uh, gender efforts or the gender-related efforts that, ha that are happening in the country, but also we want to be able to uh, meet uh, more targets. And as I mentioned, because these are all positive for the economy, they increase productivity, and when productivity goes up, men are paid more as well. Aditya, do you want to come back at all on that? Uh, you know, I mean, it's great in concept and theory, but I mean, my, my concern is when it comes to practice, especially with the COVID crisis which has come about. Uh, 
I mean, how long do you think, I mean, it would really actually have impact? I mean, in all the developing countries, I mean, to be very honest with you, I mean, we all want this in theory. Practice is a different story, isn't it? In Egypt, in India too, for that matter. Um, it is absolutely correct that uh, uh, the, the, the risk that all of us are facing is that COVID pushes back uh, the agenda, uh, because the, uh, there are other things that came up which are more urgent or more pending. But that's why within our framework, this accelerator, there is a first topic which has to do with how do you reskill women to face uh, uh, job market needs post-COVID or during COVID. And that includes digitalization, ensuring that, uh, for instance, I was in uh, Upper Egypt just uh, last week uh, in community schools where we make sure that, uh, uh, you know, uh, still girls are able to go to the schools, uh, even if uh, their parents, because of the uh, uh, COVID uh, repercussions, uh, are unemployed. And there are uh, ways uh, to create th those incentives. So uh, the agenda is there. Uh, I think what we need to do is showcase uh, the successes so that we can scale them up. Uh, right. I'm not saying- Now, now Minister, what I'd, like, but what I'd like to do is interrupt because we have an important moment, which is when Antonio Vittorini has joined us. Um, who's coming from the uh, International Organization for Migration, Director General, Antonio. So I'm going to interrupt you because I don't want to lose him because, Antonio, you've had a frustrating half hour trying to get on. And so welcome. And I hope your microphone is open. Please open your microphone. Unmute your microphone. Uh, yes, and I hope it is. You can good. hear me. Yes, we can. Yes. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Jitesh. Uh, for your in, your contribution. So, Minister, can you just stand by? Because we'd like to hear uh, from Antonio, if we may. And we hope to get uh, Princess Martha back as well. Antonio, I was saying right at the beginning, what is the challenge? What is missing now in, 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 in nurturing inclusive leadership? And first of all, how would you define inclusive leadership, particularly with all the enormous uh, challenges you're facing on migration uh, and the movement of people around the world at the moment. What needs to be inclusive about leadership to understand and act in the way that you are looking for? Well, it's, first of all, thank you so much for having me at last. I will be very brief saying that uh, in my view, in the current situation, inclusive leadership means that there is the political will among not only the uh, government officials, but also the civil society work together to face this uh, terrible pandemic we are confronted with that has stopped the world, but we need to relaunch mobility worldwide. And uh, relaunching mobility means three main things. First, everybody needs to feel safe from the health point of view. So inclusive leadership is the one who sends the right messages about everybody, wherever they are, they are not only entitled to health care, but they will also be entitled to have access to the vaccines once they are met. The second point is that there is no social economic recovery without relaunching mobility worldwide. And we need to guarantee that mobility uh, takes place in a healthy environment, which will change quite a lot the way we travel, the way tourism is handled, the way border controls are made. And last but not least, we need to depolarize a number of debates, especially the one concerning migration. Demonizing migrants is the wrong approach. And therefore, the hyperpolarization of our democracies are killing fundamental human values. That's the fight of today. There you have. Now, we've already heard, um, we've had been having a good one-to-one -one conversation with Rania Al-Mashad, who's the Minister of International Cooperation in Egypt. So I'm going to pick up a couple of points that she has made very clearly. But um, at the heart of that is that in COVID-19, particularly when it comes to diversity and the role of women, there really is, has been a silver lining. In other words, on, on nurturing inclusive leadership, inclusive leadership has emerged much faster than it would have done otherwise, despite the horrors and the sinister nature of what we're all experiencing with COVID. Is that what you're seeing as well? I've seen some areas, like, for instance, in research for a vaccine, definitely. In the healthcare system, where in the front line, in a number of uh, developed countries, the main fighters against the COVID were migrants or migrant origin people. 
and women especially. But on the other side, I must say very clearly, everywhere in the world, we are witnessing uh, a race of gender-based violence, of aggression to women and girls, especially in those cases where women and girls are stranded due to the closure of the borders, due to the travel restrictions, due to the lockdowns. And therefore, I think that we have a mixed picture today about what are the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Some positive cases, but also some very negative and disturbing, especially when it comes to stigmatization of migrants uh, as uh, virus carriers. That is a very, an issue of enormous concern. And therefore, I believe that an inclusive leadership is the one who stands by values and explains to the public at large that including migrants, for instance, or refugees in the access to health care and also in the plans for the social economic recovery after the pandemic is a key test for a real inclusive leadership. All right. Well, we've got 15 minutes to run. So let me encourage anyone who's out there who'd like to um, put a question or, or comment on this. Please get your message to me as soon as possible. But my second question is about and I'm, do, I've been doing a lot of work on thinking the unthinkable. And we've just heard from the minister about how some within her organizations and what she's seen in public service have been thinking the unthinkable. But I put to you the following do you think actually the current cohort of leaders around the world in the corporate sector and in politics really um, are the people who can create inclusive leadership? Because the way they've got to power and the way they've been elected actually in many ways is sometimes not what you need for inclusive leadership because the nature of the way they've got there is rather different to the kind of inclusive leadership that is needed. In other words, do we need a new cohort of leaders, particularly from the next generation? Well, you, you do not produ produce leaders in a factory. <laughs> they need to come out from the society. And uh, I'm very hopeful that uh, an inclusive leadership is the one who is not restricted to government officials. I, I think that's the Secretary General of the United Nations had made it very clear. We need to have a multilateralism that is a multi-stakeholder <laughs> metabolism. Multilateralism, building not only on intergovernment organizations, but also on non-governmental organizations from the corporate sector, from the civil society. Our experience in IOM is that we are very successful in engaging local authorities who are leaders closer to the problems and closer to the people and involving the civil society at local level in addressing the challenges. So don't just look to the world at large. Go down, go deeper, and see mm -hmm. how you can have inclusive leaderships at the grassroots level. Thank you. Well, look, Minister, what I'd like to do is, is you, you mentioned your four Cs. I'd like you to come back into the conversation. We've already heard it, but Antonio didn't. Can you put to him the four Cs and let's get his response? Because I'd like you to explain what you mean by the four Cs. Uh, so, starting so, starting with competence, apart from anything else. Yeah, so so I, I tell you the context of where they came out. When I was at the IMF leaving in 2005 to come to Egypt to be sub-governor of the central banks, uh, central bank, my colleagues at the IMF were very worried. Rania, you're a female going and leading a, something new in your country. We're worried. And, I, and that's when I told them, you know, women have been working in civil society, in civil service in Egypt for years. Uh, what, but I feel that my four uh, uh, principles of success are competence, that comes number one, connections, uh, confidence, and charm. If you have those four things and work on them, uh, whether man or woman, you'll be able, to, uh, you'll be able to, to make it. What do you think of that, Antonio? Is that a basis for moving forward? Well, I like the idea of the four Cs, especially the charm one, which is emotional intelligence uh, in action. But uh, I think that the key issue is confidence. There is a lack of confidence in the institutions uh, and not just in public institutions. I think that some uh, corporate sectors are also confronted with the challenge of building confidence among the public opinion. 
especially when it comes to climate change, for instance. I think that the public opinion nowadays is much more aware of the need to require from the corporate sector an engagement in the fight against climate change. And therefore, rebuilding confidence is not just making your product or your service uh, appropriate to the needs of the consumers. It's also to be careful about the way you do that and how you contribute to improve the global environment. Whether it is on climate, whether it is on respect for human rights, especially the rights of children going against uh, labor, labor, child labor, and whether it is when it comes to the respect of the workers' rights, which is extremely important to guarantee an improvement even of the productivity of the different economic sectors. Thank you. Let, let me now go to the executive director of the Collins Group, Jolene Ivanov. I hope you can hear me, Jolene. Um, yes, you. Make sure you're, oh, I can hear you as well. So what's your point? Uh, thank you for the positive discussion and uh, having uh, the statement of uh, Her Excellency, the Minister of International Cooperation of Egypt. Uh, nowadays, it's so important to, to take place uh, innovation and technology uh, with the uh, global players and therefore, I'll be very interested to understand uh, her experience from Washington, D.C. and now in Egypt, uh, how support we can receive in order to develop uh, innovation digital center with uh, virtual reality for the global education as well. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Minister. Uh, well, for, can I just say uh, two things before I answer the question? Please do. Uh, yeah, so I just want to say Antonio uh, was uh, as if he was with us, uh, uh, you know, early on because he, he mentioned that charm is emotional intelligence. And that's exactly what I uh, was trying to, to explain. And it does apply for men and women. And also when he talks about confidence for corporates, that's exactly what I mean uh, by inclusivity, because corporates today have to have a compelling story to keep their customers on board. And that is through the ESG uh, principles. Uh, for technology, uh, and, and I had a very long discussion yesterday uh, on, uh, on technology. Technology is very, very important to create growth, but technology does not ensure inclusivity. And that's why governments, civil society, private sector need to come together to ensure uh, that we, ha uh, that we have uh, a proper plan so that when we are uh, creating the infrastructure uh, for, uh, uh, for technology, everybody's included. We have a very good experiment in Egypt on education uh, because we had started reforms a few years ago under a, a program with the World Bank. So when COVID hit, uh, schooling online uh, was, and we're talking about many students because of the size of the population. So this was an extremely important uh, exercise, but much more needs to be done. And definitely through the Ministry of uh, Communication and Information Technology, uh, our colleague here, we can we can get in touch afterwards and, and discuss uh, ways to push that uh, to push that forward. Thank you, Minister. I'm going to go to Royston Flood in a moment, but um, Antonio, let me come back to you, if I may. Inclusive leadership when you're dealing with the enormous challenges you've got on the human waves and the human movement, which is at the heart of the IOM mission. When you look at what's happening, um, particularly in Eastern Europe and particularly some governments, which is at the heart of real anxiety within the European Union. Would you say that what we're seeing in, in some nations of Eastern Europe, there is inclusive leadership because it's certainly not including the kind of people you're trying to represent when it comes to migrants and those who are, are fleeing? Well, migration policy is a national sovereign policy, and therefore mm. there are differences from member state to member state. What I say to those governments is that no government alone can tackle the challenges of migration. And the idea that uh, you can prevent migrants to move to your country is a pure illusional uh, idea. But of course, uh, I fully agree with what doing, the minister they're doing said. It, aren't they? But they're doing Sorry? it. Sorry? They are doing it. Well, they are stopping migrants coming. They, that's the rhetoric. But if you look to the figures, the reality is somehow the difference in the sense that there are thousands of migrants, even in those countries, that theoretically reject the presence of migrants. It's a, it's a more complicated discussion, because yes, it is what, not just what, a question. What I'm getting to is the nationalism that has been raised by all of yeah. this. Many sovereign governments becoming far more nationalistic. 
But uh, no government alone will be able to answer the challenges. No government alone. So international cooperation is always needed in order to tackle not just migratory pressure, but also the key challenge of integrating migrants in the countries of destination. Let me just add one to... very brief thing on but, but technology. Let, let me press technology because... is a very important issue. But you have to use the word xenophobia and, and racism towards migrants. And that that's a massive rising challenge. That is not inclusive leadership, is it? Absolutely not. But I, I'll be very frank with you. Uh, stigmatization and xenophobia is not just an issue that you can find in countries of destination. Let's be very clear. We are dealing with millions of migrants that are stranded because of the lockdowns, because of the closure of the borders. We try to return those migrants back to their countries of origin. And even in those countries of origin, there are suspicions about the migrants that return because they might be virus carriers. So the, the issue should not be just uh, focused on some specific country. It's a worldwide problem that we need to address, not just xenophobia and stigmatization, but also manifestations of racism that are on the rise. And of course, an inclusive leadership needs to stand by values. And values, standing by values means confronting those positions that are highly discriminatory and deny our human nature. Thank you, Antonio. We've got three minutes left, literally. So what I'm going to do is ask Rania quickly, if you can, what, what's your reaction to that? Standing by values. You know, you're, dare I say, you're, you're of a next generation and therefore there's a change underway and there's a change underway in leadership. What, what, yes. what, how much is values, how much are values critical in all of this? I mean, I mean, when I said authentic, probably that's what Antonio means by values. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think we are, we are, you know, speaking the same language, but, but using different words. Uh, the other thing on multilateralism, and because I'm international cooperation minister, uh, I said very recently that multilateralism is uh, like sports. Uh, there is competition, but there definitely is complementarity. And therefore, uh, as Antonio pointed out, no country can do this in isolation. COVID showed that all of us have to cooperate to get out of uh, out of COVID, and that is just going to be a message that we need to keep on pushing uh, in different uh, in different ways. One thing I will conclude with, because I saw a question from the audience, is like, uh, where are people in all of this? And I want to say that with our development partners, we're creating a global partnership narrative that says people and projects and purpose. People are the core of our work. Projects are in action and purpose uh, are the driving force. And the purpose here is to try and meet the 2030 uh, SDG right. goals that all countries have committed to. Thank you. Apologies. Several people have bounced off this. Antonio, literally in 45 seconds, if you can, given <laughs> that there is a retreat from globalization, which is, seems inexorable at the moment, and the word used by Rania is cooperation, the need for more cooperation. That's at the heart of her mission in Egypt. Do you see cooperation at the moment or do you see cooperation fading away, dissolving and therefore really challenging the principle of inclusive leadership? Literally in 45 seconds, please. Otherwise, we lose the signal. Well, in 45 seconds, I would say that we see asymmetric cooperation. And mm. what we need is to rebalance globalization to take the best of the instruments that we have and that we need to create to foster cooperation. But definitely, cooperation is a must. And uh, no one can uh, run away from it. What we are in need in the international arena is leadership. Leadership that fosters cooperation. That's the missing link. Leadership that fosters cooperation. And I can see, Rania, you're, you're nodding as well. We have 45 seconds. And we, I have to thank you, Antonio, for your patience and making sure you came online from Geneva. Rania, for, thank you very much indeed for, for, um, for coming on as well. And our apologies to Princess Martha Louise of Norway. We saw you, but we just, I'm afraid, couldn't hear you clearly enough. So what we've seen very clearly is the urgent need not to be complacent about leadership. And that's what we're doing in the Thinking the Unthinkable project, trying to get people to think in very different ways. Thank you all for joining us. Apologies to those who couldn't get on and bounced off when I tried to go to you. But I did try and get to you uh, with your comments. And that's it from uh, this session on uh, nurturing inclusive leadership from me, Nick Gowing. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone.